His presence is good. His presence is good. There's no sense in doing anything if, if you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> you know, why, why, would you get, why would you get in the car to go somewhere and not know the directions? Not know where you're going. Unless that's the purpose. <laughs> okay, that's okay. But if you want to go to your friend's house, if you want to go to XYZ place, if you want to go to the grocery store, maybe you go to visit a new town. I want to go to the grocery store. Is your first thought to jump in the car and drive around? <laughs> no, you go, how do I find out how to get to the grocery store? Same. And, and it's common sense, right? Common sense. But, uh, you know, you don't waste time by finding out what God's will is in your life. I don't care how long it takes. I don't care how long it takes. How many years of dead ends and rabbit trails and beating the air, Paul said, because people made assumptions, because people didn't want to wait for God's will. Part of the problem is you can be a Christian. You can be a Christian, love the Lord to a degree, but... If your own will isn't submitted to his will, you don't want to give up the control. So you find your own way to serve God. And you say you're doing his will. But did you ask him? Did you submit it to him? See, because Christianity is not a club. It's, it's not a religion. I mean, I know the world calls it a religion. God doesn't have anything to do with religion. Religion is man's approach in many different ways, in many different, uh, what's, th- they're counterfeits. There's one God, there always has been, there always will be. And He is the creator of everything. He's your Father, if you've been born again. But He is your creator, everybody's creator. Let's see. <coughs> he has, religion is, religion's man's way of doing things in the name of God. And there can be a certain degree of your will that you step out and you assume, well, that I'm going to do God's will. Well, let's make sure we know it first. Amen. And it is no waste of time to just sit and listen. It's no waste of time. You know how many times, you know, <laughs> like this is sometimes the battle we have and we're going somewhere. I would rather take five minutes sitting in my driveway making sure I know how to get to a place instead of assuming I know how to get to a place and take 30 minutes longer. Anybody with me on this? Does that make sense? See, and and following God's the same way. Wherever this finds you, if it's at the beginning of your life or if it's at the end of your life or if it's, or it's really your walk with God is the question, right? Because time, God doesn't care about time. He cares about he cares about uh, relationship. He cares about the choices you make. And uh, early on in my walk, I used to think, look, there's no getting around it. The more time you spend with God, the more you're going to know Him. The less time you spend, the less you'll know Him. Do what you want with that. Okay? <clears throat> but I used to think, I used to think, you know, X, Y, Z hours is what God's looking for. Um, and it's true, it's necessary. Don't, see, the flesh likes to justify excuses, give you excuses why you don't have to do something. Don't let your flesh run you around like that, okay? But God doesn't, you know, it's not like, okay, if I pray four hours today, let's say I was real. I, I just really got into it. I prayed four hours today. I was spending, I spent four hours with God. I got up at four o'clock. I went all the way till eight. And in my own little head, you know, I think I put a star on that day, you know, star, good job. But do you know God doesn't fellowship with the amount of hours you put in? And what I mean by that is what he's looking for really is change. Everybody say change. God, do you know God does not change? He never has and he never will. Now, that doesn't mean he doesn't, he, he gets involved in your life, right? He's an active, moving God. He's always on the move. He's not stagnant. 
He's creative. He's explosive. He's dynamic. But he is who he is, right? He, he cannot change himself. If you don't like the truth, if the whole world doesn't like the truth, he's not going to change just because the world doesn't like the truth. He is who he is. Amen? Well, see, fellowship with God, getting to know God more, it has nothing to do with counting your hours that you spend, how many times you get through this book. Now hear me, the more you read this, the more you're going to know the truth of word, the Word of God. You give a little, you know a little. You give a lot, you know a lot. All right? <clears throat> but God's not looking for hours, and He's not looking. Let's see. If all I do is come up when I go to heaven, and then I come up and I said, I read this book a thousand times in my lifetime. My lifetime, I got through it a thousand times. And I prayed with you all the days of my life. Now, he's looking for fellowship with you. And he's looking for change in your heart. Now, these are the things that will produce change. But they are not the things themselves. Look, what I'm saying is this. Prayer isn't the goal. It's the, it's the vehicle you get into change. Reading this isn't the goal. It's, it's the vehicle you get into change. We don't fast for fasting's sake so we can go about telling people how much we fast. I pray to God I get to the place where I never have to fast again, right? Because I want my body and my old man, that's the wrong terminology, I want my flesh to be submitted to the will of God. Okay, I don't want the will of God submitted to my flesh. Don't want to get that switched around, right? So, we're looking for change. Everybody say change. change. See, because God does not change. And here's, <clears throat> this is one of those things that kind of hits you between the eyes. You know, I used to think that I would grow into, oh, how do I phrase that? All of the promises of God are yes to you right now. They're right now. He doesn't change. Do you know it's God's will for you right now to walk in the gifts? Ooh, <laughs> to walk in the gifts of the Spirit? Do you know that? Do you know right now, if you were at that place with Him, He'd be doing it with you right now, yesterday. See, you, those gifts don't drop on you. Heaven doesn't come down. It's as down as it's going to be. Everything is yes right now. Where you come is you change how you walk with Him and how you have trust and fellowship with Him. See, And we keep thinking when God intervenes in our life in some miraculous way, you, there's this mentality that's, that's trained into us that it's God who's deciding to drop something on you. Look, He's fellowshipping with you where you're at. Okay, He's endeavoring to meet your needs according to the riches and glory by Christ Jesus where you're at right now. He's intending to heal you right now. You want evidence for that. Um, the whole life of Jesus. How about that? We got four gospels dedicated to the man Jesus. And Jesus said, he says, anything I do, I see my father doing it. He said, uh, I think it was to Philip, he says, if you've seen me, you have seen the father. Jesus is the express, he is the express image of God. What God's will would be done in every scenario. Everybody say every scenario. Every scenario Jesus encountered, God's will was done. All right? God's will was done in every single scenario. Now the one I love to use because it paints such a stark picture of the difference between faith and faithlessness. When his disciples came, do you guys remember when the disciples came and they tried to cast that lunatic spirit out of the boy? Remember? The father brought that boy to the disciples. And this boy from a young age, he, he would, you know, he would have convulsions and seizures and he'd be foaming at the mouth and he would be thrown into the water and thrown into the fire, hurt himself. In one place it says he pineth away, which is King James for... 
uh, basically he, he was skin and bones. So you have this real emaciated skin and bones figure frothing at the mouth that would convulse and be thrown into to, to dangerous situations. And when the disciples prayed for that boy. Now, let's just back up. Those disciples, they had already been commissioned. Do you know they were the ones that went out and prayed and, 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 and rebuked devils and saw people healed? And Jesus commissioned them, said, said um, freely you have received, freely give. In my name, go do these works. Cast out devils, okay? Um, lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. Raise the dead and preach the kingdom of the gospel. Or the, the, the uh, good news of the kingdom, see? And that was the order he says. He says, I want you, this is how Jesus thought. He says, I want you boys, I'm gonna commission you by my word. I'm putting my authority on you right now. You go on out and you go into these cities and you declare the kingdom of God is at hand. You declare this. So you come into a town, he says, the kingdom of God is at hand. Where is the sick? Where are the oppressed? We're going to heal them in the name of Jesus. You've heard of Jesus. We're here to heal in his name. They would do that, and then they would preach the kingdom to them. They would preach the kingdom. So you saw all of these signs and wonders and miracles. He says, this is the message that Jesus came to give us, and we're giving it to you. I mean, is that not a, that's not just words. That's display. That's seeing and believing. Do you understand? See. And this is what Jesus sent them out to do. These same guys, these same guys that came to this lunatic boy, after this had happened, came to the lunatic boy, prayed for him, and everybody knows nothing happened, right? Everybody know this passage? Nothing happened. Now, right there, you have a decision. Is God's word true or not? That's the decision. And see, where religion, what religion does with those situations where we pray, we throw it to God. And we say, well, this must be God. God doesn't always do this. God isn't always, you know, he picks and chooses those he heals. Like he respects some and not others. Could you imagine me having healing and I could give it to one of my kids, but I don't give it to another kid? And I'm not as good as God is. Jesus said this about the Father God. He says, if you guys would give, if your children asked for bread, would you give them rocks? <laughs> they want fish and you'd give them a scorpion? <laughs> he says, how much better do you think your Father God is? Come on. See, and when Jesus came down off of that mountain and he saw the situation, I get, okay, let's go there. I'm, I'm not just going to recount it. I want to read it. Let's go to, I believe it's um, Matthew And if it's not, I will try again. It's three strikes, right? <laughs> okay, 17. I w that, that counts. I was close enough. <laughs> Matthew 17. I want you to see this progression here. <clears throat> we'll start in Matthew 17, verse 14. Now, Jesus had taken three of his disciples up to the mountain. Um, and then he come down with them. In verse 14, it says, And when they were come to the multitude... There came to him a certain man kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is a lunatic and sore vexed. For oftentimes he falleth into the fire and often into the water. And I brought him to thy disciples and they could not cure him. Now, look, God doesn't change. Am I right? Or, uh, I don't think excuses hold up to God. Now, if Jesus always tells the truth, and we are his disciples today, you can apply these verses to yourself or you can go on. I don't want to beat the air. I want to have, have the results he told me I could have. All right? So, let's take these words as they say. 
Now, I brought him to thy disciples, and they could not cure him. Verse 17. Then Jesus answered and said, You gave it your best shot. Must not have been God's will. Now, this was the revised version. This is the present times version. This is, you know, God doesn't always do things the same way version. Everybody with me? (laughs) No. Okay. It would be easier, but it wouldn't be right. (laughs) Then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him here to me. Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the devil, and he departed out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. Now, what was God's will for that boy to be cured? Isn't it plain as day? It's plain as day what God's will is in this situation. Because Jesus never did anything that was not God's will. Now, these disciples, they went And they tried to do what Jesus told them to do. They said the right words. They did the right things. But nothing happened. And Jesus says, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer? Now, why is he asking these questions? He knows there's a time coming where he's not going to be here. Why is he saying this? He says, I'm not going to be here forever. I can't do this forever. You have to have the faith. That's why he's, why would he rebuke him without an expectation? You think he's just mocking them for fun? If, if he did not expect them to do this, there'd be no point in him saying this. Everybody with me? And this is what we face every time we pray for somebody. Are we going to put it on God or are we going to look at ourselves? Bring him here to me. (laughs) Now, Jesus is a man like you and I. And he was trying to convey to his disciples, look, the same works that I do, you're going to do also. You're going to have to learn faith. All right, now we're going to go into some of the details of this. And there's another verse I want to highlight. But, and Jesus rebuked the devil and he departed out of him. And the child was cured that very hour. That was God's will for that situation. Then came the disciples to Jesus apart. So they didn't ask him in front of the whole multitude that was there. They afterwards, you know, hey, Jesus, what happened there? Now here, why would you ask, why couldn't we cast them out if they knew? Do you think they knew the problem? Why would you ask if you knew? You wouldn't. They they were being honest. Why don't? Look at this. Jesus rebuked the devil and departed him out of him, and that child was cured from that very hour. Then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, why could we not cast him out? Why did he ask? Because they'd done it before. And Jesus said unto them, because of unbelief. Now look, do you think they knew they had unbelief? I don't think they did. Otherwise, why ask? Why ask if you knew it was your unbelief? And what kind of unbelief is it that keeps this from happening? Do you think they didn't believe in their Jesus? The one they were following? They laid down. Look, these are the excuses that we make in our lives. I've laid my life down. I've given all these hours to prayer. I've spent all this time fasting. I've done da, 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 da. It's not my fault. (laughs) Why would they ask if they knew? They didn't know. It's not the kind of unbelief We've been talking about believing, right? Last week we talked about a believing, and we've talked in times past about how believement is believing is more than just mere agreement with truth, right? More than mere agreement because they believed in who Jesus was. But come on, they'd seen some of the things Jesus had done. They had done some of the things that Jesus had commissioned them to do. But he he still says he says because of your unbelief. So what's the problem? I, I mean. You can, you can put it on God all of you want, and God's, it's always, you know, it's always on God, and God is, uh, what's the word? What's that real? Sovereign, okay? Sovereign. Now, is God sovereign? Absolutely, yes, he is. 
He sovereignly gave you dominion over this place. And he sovereignly expects you to have faith in his word. And he sovereignly expects your trust. He is sovereign. Doesn't make you unaccountable. All right? His sovereignty is not a justification for whatever. Many, many believe that God's will is always done in spite of their choices. Obviously not. I mean, even in this case where they were trying to do God's will, it wasn't done. And Jesus still says, well, it's because of unbelief. If you don't like it, I can't help it. <laughs> it's here. It's here, right? Everybody's got the same Bible, right? <laughs> All right. For verily I say unto you, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you shall say unto this mountain. Now, what mountain? The mountain they just came off of. Jesus and the three were up on that mountain. That was the mountain of transfiguration. They just come off. He says, you know, you wouldn't be able to just speak to it. You could speak to that mountain tell it to go. Why? Because it's not your power. It's trust in his power. It's not your ability. It's trust in his ability. What determines faith? It's not a creed that you adhere to or believe or agree with. Something changes in your heart that causes belief and trust implicitly in God. Something changes. Now look at the remedy he gives here. He doesn't just say it's because of your unbelief and get off in a huff and leaves. He gives you the solution. Everybody thankful that Jesus never gives you the answer to a problem, but he also gives you the solution to the problem. He says, it's because of your unbelief. And he says, for verily I'd say unto you, if you had faith as a grain of mustard seed, you could say unto this mountain, remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove. In fact, nothing should be impossible to you. How be it? Everybody say, how be it? How be it? This kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. <clears throat> What's prayer and fasting do? Does it change God? Does it, see, a lot of times, this is what people think when they go on extensive fasts and they go on extensive prayer times. They think they finally beat down God's door to get him to listen to them. God's been hearing you from day one. What's been the trouble is the unbelief. And the prayer and the fasting puts your heart in a place of receptiveness and trust in God's will to the degree that you receive an answer. Whether it takes a one-day fast or a 40-day fast, it has nothing to do with the length in terms of getting a hold of God. God is here. The problem is the unbelief in the flesh, the level of it, it's in the way. So how long do you pray and how long do you fast? Until the unbelief is gone. I don't know what that is for you and you don't know what that is for me. But between you and the Holy Ghost, you need to work together to mortify the deeds of the flesh. Everybody with me? Now, I, wanna, I just want to dwell on this. You know this scenario. Part of the, they'd, they'd cast out devils before. They'd, they'd healed the sick before. Why not this one? Why not this one? Part of it, see, what is that verse? Help me. Um, <clears throat> Faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. You walk by faith, not by sight. See, Part of why this one was so difficult to them was they had such a degree of exposure to their senses. Could you imagine, put yourself in this place. Someone comes to you and they say, I know you know God. You've healed the sick before. You've, you've prayed for people. And they come to you and they bring someone. This is you. Everybody say, this is me. You're a follower of Jesus, aren't you? <laughs> Amen. So here they come. They've come with somebody. I have a lunatic son. You know Jesus, don't you? You've healed the sick before, don't you? Here he is. And he's, he's all emaciated. He's pining away, the King James says. He's, he's so thin, and he's foaming at the mouth, and he's being convulsed and thrown all over the place. You, I'm going to back up a little bit from that. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to have a little bit of, holy cow, this is bad. This is too bad for me. This is, I can't handle this. It's not you handling it. It's trusting God. 
See? And this thing had such an impact on their senses that it caused them to waver in whether or not God was willing to do it through them. It had such an impact. And this is why Jesus said the remedy is prayer and fasting. Because prayer and fasting doesn't give you strength in your flesh. It gives you strength in your spirit. And when you pray and you fast, you start to fight and go to war with those places that believe only by what they see and not by what God's word says. Let's go to another verse, and I'm going to have to look it up because I wasn't sure if we were going to preach on it. I think it's in Matthew. Um, Flip to Matthew. um, Try Matthew 8, but I'm going to look it up here. No, 14, Matthew 14. Now see, if you don't really know what the problem is, you'll never be able to walk in the solution. Everybody say amen to that you don't know what the problem is how are you going to know the solution all right i read this once this is a good uh, you know modern day example during world war ii um, they were trying to figure out ways to keep some of their planes in the air longer right because they would undergo a lot of flak and a lot of enemy fire and so what they started to do was the planes that came back they would survey them to see where the most damage was done, right? And so 90%, or I forget what it was, but most of the damage was done on the wings, 80% of the damage. 80% of the damage was done in the wings of these planes, you know, like the old P-51 Mustangs and those old World War II planes. Well, they were trying to, how do we best reinforce these planes so they don't get shot down so much? That was a good, good idea, right? So they started to survey all of these planes and try and figure out where is most of the damage occurring. So we reinforced those areas. Well, I think it was some some figure like 80% of the damage that occurred in the planes they were surveying was taking place in the wings. So their genius idea was let's reinforce the wings. Does that make logical sense to you? Kind of. Let's reinforce the wings. So... They were about to initiate a plan where they would put more steel around the wings so that there would be greater resistance to enemy fire so they wouldn't get shot down so much. They wanted a solution. They didn't understand the problem. And a mathematician came in there and he says, he says, you're not accounting for all the variables here. He says, you're surveying the planes that come back. You're not surveying the planes that get shot down. He says, he says, you, you're not working with all of the information. You're only looking at the information for the planes that return, the ones that did come back. And you're seeing for all of the enemy fire in those planes. You, if you reinforce the wings, it's not going to help a bit because the planes that are getting shot down are being shot down in the fuselage, the body. And see, and so th- it saved, could you imagine all these millions of dollars being pumped out by the government? To reinforce something that doesn't really matter. Everybody say beat in the air. That's beat in the air. So he says if you want to save your planes. Reinforce the fuselage. Look at. It's because all the damage that's occurring. It's occurring to these planes. The ones that are in the sea. Is the ones you need to worry about. Not the ones that come back. <laughs> See. See if you understand the problem. You can have the solution. And Jesus is giving you the problem. The problem is unbelief. That's what he said, not me. That's what he said. See, so if you want the solution, he gave it to you. It's prayer and fasting. We've done whole messages on prayer and fasting, what it does to you, how it puts you in a place of receiving from God and how it keeps you. See, because your senses are powerful things, but they were never de- designed to lead you and guide you. He is supposed to lead you and guide you. But if your senses can be overloaded to such a degree where you start to question God's word, the enemy will bring sensory information to you that causes you not to believe. That's what he does. Even at the very beginning, when Adam, before he even fell, he come and said, hath God said. 
Isn't that not what he does? He comes with, hath God said. You know how the devil comes and says, hath God said to you? It's circumstances. It's pains. It's situations. It's outward things that affect your senses. When God gives you a promise in the word, he comes with circumstances and he comes with pains and he comes with situations and he says, hath God said. It never fails. Whenever mom gets up here and preaches about healing, the very first thing that happened next week, she gets like five or six calls, everybody's sick. Hath God said? Hath God said? Why? Because he wants to challenge the truth of the word of God in your life. And if he lets you, or if, no, if you let him, he'll steal the fruit. That is what he comes to do. The enemy comes to steal the word. He doesn't want the word bearing any truth in your life. He doesn't want the word and the promises of God coming in effect. So when the word comes of the promise of God, he comes and says, hath God said, and he hits you with a sickness. Or he does this, or he does that. Or whatever the case may be. Maybe you're believing God for a change in your family situation, and it gets worse. Hath God said? Everybody with me? Everybody in Matthew chapter 14? We'll start here in verse 23. And this is Jesus. And when he had, I'll let everybody flip to it. Matthew 14, 23. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. But the ship was now, and in, in the context, he sent the disciples ahead in the ship. Because, so all the disciples are on the ship. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, okay? For the wind was contrary. <laughs> I can't. I, the, the word of God told me. You know what I just heard when I read that? The spirit lusts against the flesh, and the flesh against the spirit. And these are contrary, the one to the other. So you cannot do the things that you would. How, see, God is the father of your spirit, is he not? And his promises to you are spiritual promises. They're nothing carnal that can be taken away. So if you're going to receive from God, it's the flesh that's the enemy in your life that steals from you. And if the flesh is pushing on you, it intends to steal the word from you. Okay? What I mean by that is if you let the flesh run your life, <laughs> it is not the inheritor of the promises of God. Ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. <laughs> and when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And they cried out for fear. <laughs> now, you would do the same thing, I'm telling you right now. You, we all know what happens here. They <laughs> you're in a boat. You're getting thrashed with water. The wind's going to try and blow your boat over, and, and then somebody's walking next to you <laughs> in the middle of the sea. Oh, you'd, you'd freak out. Come on. Yes, you would. Yes, you would. Guys included. All right. <laughs> but straightway, Jesus spoke unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I. Be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou... Bid me come unto thee on the water. Now look at this, verse 29 here. And he said, come. Everybody say, Jesus said, come. Do you know his word is truth? It says in another place that heaven and earth will pass away, but his words will never pass away. If he said it, then it's true. Everybody with me? But somehow, look, look at this, look at this. God's word being true doesn't mean you inherit it. Look at this. Well, Jesus said it. I can't help it. It's here. Jesus said, come. Look at what happens. Now, the, Maybe you've heard this preached on, but this is hitting me in a fresh way because I, I, I forgot about this verse, honestly. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. Now, none of you have ever done that that I know of. 
If you have, please come talk to me after church. I want to I wanna talk to you. <laughs> but he walked on that wa- He walked on it. It says it right there. Peter was come down out of the ship. He walked on the water to go to Jesus. But look at... So here, word of God established forever. Truth forever. God is sovereign. These are the religious things that are thrown around, the platitudes that just kind of keep washing over you like everything that happens is God. Jesus said, come. You're not going to change that. It's true. And look, he walked for a bit, but look at this. But when he saw, everybody say saw. Saw. When he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid and he began to sink. Well, didn't Jesus say he could walk? Didn't he say it? How come it just didn't happen when Jesus said? Because something in your heart matters to receiving the promises. Everybody with me? If your heart wavers, Look at what happened. He walked for a bit and then he fell. Because he began to trust, let me put it, he began to believe the circumstances over the word from Jesus. He began to trust in what has been happening over what God said to do. And this is why I don't agree with open door theology. Open door theology says that if God wants to open the door, he will, and I'll walk through it. The devil would gladly open 20 doors for you to get you to go do something he's not, you're not supposed to do. And sometimes you're supposed to kick doors down in the face of all the doors being slammed in, you, in front of you. Because I tell you what, when God tells you to go do something, it's not always a picnic. The devil will come with circumstances to test exactly what Jesus has told you to do. And if you let him, he'll steal the word from you. This is, what, this is what was going on with Paul. Everywhere he went and declared the works of the Lord. Beatings, stonings, in jail, in, jail, in danger, it, being shipwrecked. Stop it. Can you just hear that? Stop it from the devil. Stop it. He wouldn't stop. I want to be like that. Amen? I'm not going to stop. <clears throat> and he said, come. And Peter was come down out of the ship and walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, boisterous, he was afraid, beginning to sink. He cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, it's not really your fault. You gave it a good try. I, I mean, that was, a, that was an A-plus effort there, boy. Look, he could have done that. He could have done that. But then you wouldn't. See, because God's, it's not about trying to make you feel better. He wants you actually whole. See, if you really love people, you're going to deliver them truth. If you really do. You're going to risk telling them the truth in spite of what they'll think of you. Because really, it's selfishness that keeps you from saying the truth in people's life. Because you're afraid of what they'll do to you. You don't love them, you love you. And, and that's okay, I've done that myself. It's not okay, but I've done that myself. I'm not going to stay that way, amen? I, I speak the truth a lot more than I used to. I used to <laughs> kind of beat around the bush. Sometimes I never quite hit the mark. I'm hitting the mark a little bit more lately. <laughs> but look at what he says. He doesn't, I, I can just see, If you meditate on this, he says, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? Why did you doubt? He's given him an explanation. You came, but you let doubt question my word to you. Whether you like it or not, you have the authority and the power. You do. Everybody say, I do. You have the authority and the power. To halt God's word to you. If, elsewise, the devil wouldn't be able to steal it and everything would be hunky-dory. But evidently, he can. And he does. And the question you need to ask yourself is, what is he stealing from me? Because he comes with the circumstances. And it was doubt. I want to go to one more verse and we'll be done. But if you have 
one of these marker things, put it right there where we are, because I might just flip back to it for a second. <clears throat> Go to James. <laughs> I was uh, just fellowshipping with the Lord earlier this week. And I was reading through that passage about Peter and, and how, how clearly it is that Jesus' intention, wasn't it Jesus' will for him to come? Wasn't it? So he couldn't just come because Jesus willed it. There, there has to be a certain amount of your heart and your will, trust in him, to walk in that. And he walked in it for a bit until he doubted. And I, was, and I was just meditating on that. And as I was listening to it, I heard the word waver. And I thought maybe it was my mind because waver sounds like wave, right? Thought, well, that's not the same word, waver and wave. And, and uh, the Holy Ghost, he's so patient. He's like, waver. <laughs> so, I was like, so I looked it up. Look, everybody go to James, everybody in James. <laughs> Okay, we'll just, we'll just read from verse 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. My brethren, count it all joy, everybody say joy, when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith works patience or endurance. Why, is, why do these things come? Is it God bringing them? He makes it very clear it's not. But the enemy comes to test the ground, doesn't he? He comes to test the ground. When he comes to test the ground, it brings or it causes, it makes you endure with patience. It makes you, okay? And let patience have a perfect work that you may be entire, perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Okay. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and abradeth not. And it shall be given to him. Everybody say shall. Look at this. It's, this is not, this is one, two, three, Jane, see the ball. I need wisdom. Ask of God and he will give it to you. Period. Everybody say period. period. But look at this. Let him ask in faith. Nothing wavering. Nothing wavering. Now, honestly, I forgot this was here. I did. I was sitting there praying and he kept saying waver, waver, waver. And look at what it says. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. Verse 7. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything from the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. What's a double-minded man look like? I trust the word of God. I trust what I see. I trust the word of God. I trust what I see. I trust the word of God. I trust what I see. You need to make your mind up. <laughs> you need to make your mind up. And Jesus said, come. I trust what you say. I trust what I see. <laughs> trust what you say. I trust what I see. Look, James, James in history was the brother of Jesus Christ. All right? I don't know this for sure but I'm willing to bet you $10. If it means anything in heaven, we'll ask, okay? <laughs> I'll, I'll bet. I'll bet that James heard about Peter. I bet he heard about this story because it was recorded. They recorded all of these things. And, you know, all of the Gospels is basically some of the, those teachings are what disseminated throughout all the churches. You know, when James and Paul and, and Peter and Jude and John a lot of what they, they also pull from the Old Testament, but a lot of what they pull from is what Jesus says. You can, if you, if you study the New Testament, you see the same principles Jesus said in his sayings. And that's what Jesus said to do. He says, go into all the world, baptize in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. See, make disciples of all nations and teach them to observe whatever I've said. Everything that Jesus said. I bet you James 
he was relating back to this, what Peter was saying. Or, I, can you imagine Peter telling the story? I mean, how many of them walked on the water? We only know of him. And he's saying, look, anybody that wavers, driven by the sea, he's like that. <clears throat> when you spend time, what Jesus said to do, when you spend time fasting and praying, you're anchoring your heart in the truth of the word of God through relationship and trust in him. That no matter what you face, I don't believe that. I believe what God told me. I believe what God told me and you're not getting me to change my mind and I'm not going to relinquish what I said. Even to the degree that when it's face to face with you and all of those circumstances, they're right in your face. I mean, I can only imagine what some of those waves and those winds look like. Can, can you picture it? I mean, think of something like Hurricane Irma. All right. You imagine standing there in the middle of that and be a, maybe being in a boat. Imagine yourself in a boat and you got eight, ten foot high waves crashing over you. And the wind so strong it barrel you over. The, look, and pe this is what people do in situations like this. God, what are you trying to say? <laughs> God's not speaking. That's not God. God's word is truth. And if you stand on it, if you will work on the place where you believe, if you will develop a trust in him that no matter what you see, I trust what he said. Because I want to inherit the promises. But God does not change. So what changes? It's me. Because I'm telling you, everything in this book is possible because he said it was. And you'd like to think that somehow Peter or Paul had a special case, but they don't. They don't. You got the same life of Christ on the inside of you that they did. I'll take it a degree further. You have the same life of Christ that Christ had. That's, what it, that's why he gave it to you. <laughs> that is in you. That is in you. Okay, just real quick, flip back. Flip back to Matthew 14. I told you to put a marker there. When I was looking this over, in verse 31 of chapter 14, Matthew 14, 31. And immediately just Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, Wherefore didst thou doubt? Do you want to know what that doubt is? It's the same thing as waver. If you look it up, another meaning for that is waver. Why did you waver? To receive the promises of God, it's not enough that we know them once. It's even not enough that you stood on the word for a little bit. It's that you never get off. That you never get off. Because the devil, he never, you know, he never stops trying the ground. And if you ever get off the ground, then he wins. And how many testimonies of ministers where they had tremendous ministries, but they got off the ground in areas? You can look back in history, some of the ones that caused great revivals, and there was tremendous power flowed through their ministries, raised the dead, they could read your mail, they could do all of those things, but they started to get off the ground and they let the flesh rule their life. Jesus said, though, he says, <clears throat> spend some time praying. Spend some time fasting. I don't want to beat the air. Amen? I don't want to get in my car, drive around for 30 minutes, and find out I don't know where I'm going. I want to get there. Everybody else want to get there? It hasn't changed the way there hasn't changed. God's the same. His word's the same. It's truth. Amen. Let's pray before we go. Father, I thank you. I thank you for your truth. I thank you for your love for us. And Lord, I thank you for grace that accompanies this message. Thank you that you love us like children. Hmm.
that, that you see such tremendous potential in us, that you're helping us every day to grow, to walk in more of what you have for us. Hmm. But I'm not, <laughs> I'm not content with believing a little bit of a lie. I don't want to believe any lie. I'm not content with 90% trust. I want complete trust. I don't want to halfway be right. I want to, I want to know that I know. I want to do those things you said I could do. So, Father, I thank you for grace and endurance and patience. May we not waver in what you've given us. That when the enemy comes to try the promises on the ground, wherever that may be, whatever promises you've given us that have been through the cross, you shed your blood, you paid the price, you've given us your word. But we can see in Peter and we can see in the disciples that even though we know your will, it doesn't necessarily mean that we have it. We want your manifested will in our lives. So I thank you for helping us work on those places that are weak and exposing them to us. And we're not going to beat the air. Let's say this together. I choose not to beat the air. I open up my heart. Holy Spirit, Correct me afresh. Help me to hear those weak places. And I promise that what you tell me, I will be diligent with it. To do it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.